Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that, well, you don't eat your lipstick, at least I hope you don't, uh, but there's a good chance that some of it gets in your mouth when you eat or lick your lips, at least if you wear lipstick, which is at least half the people listening today. Many beauty products contain gluten for a whole bunch of different reasons, and sometimes in just trace amounts. So if you're like really sensitive to gluten, even the amount of gluten in your lipstick might give you symptoms. Although it's not that likely, but still it's kind of interesting that they somehow find a way to get gluten in your lipstick. Today's guest just about needs no introduction. He's a, a very famous guy, a guy whose work had a big impact on my life when I was working to lose 100 pounds and learn how to keep it off going back uh, even into the, the mid-90s. And has been a, a persistent voice and one of the very early voices talking about what hormonal effects of foods are in the body. Today, he's a leading authority on the impact of diet on genetic expression and on inflammation. He's published 40 scientific articles, has 14 US patents in IV drug delivery systems for cancer and hormonal regulation and cardiovascular diseases. He's written 13 books, including a number one New York Times bestseller called The Zone that sold 6 million copies. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Barry Sears. Uh, uh, Dr. Sears, or Barry, as I'm going to call you in the interview, it's an honor to have you on the show. I, I can't believe I'm talking to you in person. It's so cool. Well, Dave, thank you very much. I'm very, very honored to be on your show. Uh, there, in order to prepare for this, I actually asked a bunch of fans on Facebook, like, if you could ask Barry Sears any question on earth, what would you want it to be? And so we sort of compiled this. Usually I don't have pre-prepared questions. I just have some ideas about what I want to talk about. And I have my own set of things I want to ask you. But today we're going to make sure that, that people who, who took the time to write in with a question, that we get at least some of the most popular questions out there. Number one, you've said that the most important new discovery you have is, is flavonoids, which is different than the sort of things you wrote about with icosanoids and some of these other things in your original work with the Zone Diet and all of the work you've done since then. Why do you put flavonoids so high on your list? Well, I, again, that when I wrote the book, The Zone, back in 1995, we knew nothing about polyphenols, of which yeah. flavonoids is a subgroup of. And so that's why it wasn't in the first book. Uh, we now know that these polyphenols are incredibly important agents because they are gene activators. Drugs can't do this. But these polyphenols, if they're taken in therapeutic levels, can activate our genes. In particular, there are three different type of gene classes they activate. At lower levels, they activate anti-inflammatory genes. These are the genes, excuse me, anti, an, antioxidative genes. These are the genes that cause the transcription of enzymes, antioxidant enzymes like superoxide dimutase and glutathione peroxidase. Why is this important? Most antioxidants are really one and done. They can knock out one free radical and they're done for the day. But these antioxidant enzymes can basically destroy tens of thousands of free radicals over and over again. They're free radical eating machines. At still higher levels, these polyphenols now activate anti-inflammatory genes, especially with those that in basically inhibit the activation of nuclear factor kappa B, the master gene that turns on inflammation. And at still higher levels, they activate the anti-aging gene, SIRT1, that makes the enzyme AMP kinase that is the key to controlling our metabolism. So we understand now the power of these polyphenols, but again, like a drug, they're only useful if given in a therapeutic levels. Can you get therapeutic levels by eating your leafy greens and your bell peppers and things like that? You certainly can if you're willing to eat about two pounds per day. <laughs> and so the, your, your laugh in the case of saying, most people say, no way, no way. Say, That's the problem. Uh, the levels of polyphenols in uh, leafy green vegetables and uh, non-starchy vegetables is actually only about one-tenth of one percent of their weight. What, what and about, so it's, it's, I have to eat a lot to get just enough. What about uh, America's favorite beverage, coffee? That's, that's America's primary uh, source of polyphenols. Not the best, but it is the primary source for Americans. Now, are Americans the healthiest people on the face of the earth? 
Nope. Probably not. But the one group of people who eat large amounts of polyphenols are those who basically live in the Mediterranean region. And that's the secret of the Mediterranean diet. Not the pasta, not the uh, you know, uh, you know, wine. The wine does contain polyphenols. But, but let's go back. Amounts, to, yeah. Exactly. Let's go back to that saying I need about one gram per day of polyphenols to turn on anti-inflammatory uh, genes. How many glasses of red wine do I have to drink per day? The answer is about 11. But say, I don't like wow. red wine. It's, it's too bitter. I like white wine. I'm saying, fine. You can only need 110 glasses a day to get enough polyphenols. So you can see getting polyphenols is a difficult process, yet it's key because they are the controllers of not only the genes that basically uh, control much of our metabolism, but they are the master sculptors of the gut. It, is there any reason not to just take these as, as vegetable concentrates? Like I take, I take grape skin polyphenols, grape seed extract. I take uh, resveratrol, transresveratrol, pterostilbean, and a, a handful of other polyphenol uh, substances in my normal daily stack of things. Uh, in, in your experience, if I eat those with a meal, especially a fat-containing meal, is there any difference to my body between those and eating you know, a, a pound or two pounds of vegetables a day? Probably not. But I there is so a either. Difference. I'm happy you said that, though. <laughs> but, but there is a difference in bioavailability. Even adding yeah. the fat, all the polyphenols you mentioned are incredibly water-insoluble. Mm -hmm. And if they're water-insoluble, they can't get into your blood. If they can't get in your blood, they're not going to do you a whole lot of good. Now, there are certain polyphenols which are more water-soluble. These are the ones you find primarily in berries. So the fact, but then you have a problem. Berries are also rich in sugars. Yep. So you have a, 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 a between a rock, rock and a hard place, and that's why concentrates, concentrates of uh, polyphenol sources, which have been now stripped out of non-biologically uh, active materials and stripped out of carbohydrates, become a very, very excellent source to maintain the levels of these uh, key ingredients we have to have on really a daily basis. One of the other guests on, on the show, Alberto Viotto, who's a, a cultural anthropologist who, who got to start finding drugs in the Amazon 25 years ago. And it, a very unusual shaman because we're talking about mitochondria all the time. <laughs> but he recommends doing things with, with high amounts of, of polyphenols only for like three, four days a week, taking a couple days off to basically keep your body from getting attenuated to having these substances so your antioxidant enzyme systems get stressed naturally. Are you a fan of cycling your polyphenols or do you take polyphenols every day? Every day. And the reason okay. why, because the half-life of polyphenols, one, they're not very well absorbed. So you have to take a lot just to try to get into the blood. If they get in the blood, their half-life is incredibly short, measured in hours. So they have only a very limited ability to basically active, you know, do their of activation of the genes, and then they're gone. And the genes they're activating are the ones you want turned on all the time. Are coffee polyphenols water-soluble? Uh, no. They're somewhat water-soluble, but by the time you get coffee, uh, the green coffee bean mm -hmm. is very rich in polyphenols. It's incredibly bitter. That's why it's rich in polyphenols. When you roast the coffee, you release the flavor, but you destroy a lot of the polyphenols. The same is true of chocolate. The, uh, the cocoa bean itself is very rich in polyphenols, but once you start to ferment it and roast it to release the flavors, you begin to destroy many of the polyphenols. With Bulletproof coffee beans, we do a, a medium roast to help preserve the integrity of some of those. And, and there's an argument for a darker roast as well because you have more chlorogenic acid, which has other health effects that aren't, isn't polyphenol driven. And it's one of those, like, you want both, but man, how do you get both in one cup of coffee? It's probably two different ones. You're trying to maintain a zone, aren't you? <laughs> well said. And, 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 and that's the secret. You know, in nutrition, nobody's wrong, but they're often not completely right. Everybody's like 12 blind men trying to describe an elephant. They're all partially right. But nutrition is incredibly complex. Uh, you know, I stand back after spending, you know, 40 years in this area, I say, just an awe of how complex it is and really how little knowledge we have. But, you know, you have certain primary things that um, you have to follow through. You need adequate protein on a daily basis. You need adequate essential uh, fats. Without them, you can't live. 
you need adequate levels of polyphenols. I consider polyphenols in, within 10 or 15 years will be considered essential nutrients, essential for human health. Now you try to get them all together with the least amount of calories and the best hormonal response. Right. And you say, oh my God, this is so hard. It's taking all the fun out of food, except food is far more powerful as a drug than you'll ever achieve because food can affect hormones. Food can affect the expression of our genes. It's really gene therapy in the kitchen. Well, there's something very interesting happening in the food industry. So I make a, a you know, coffee and, and nutritional oils and, and protein powders and things like that. And I'm aware of, of some of the effects uh, that they have. Even when I have studies uh, u- using my stuff, I'm not allowed to talk about the studies because they manufacture them. Uh, because I'm not a drug company, I'm a food company, right? And, and so I'm seeing huge numbers of, of startups and, and food companies making uh, the so-called functional foods that have genetic benefits, that change your gut biome, that do all these things. And as soon as the creators of those foods who care enough about the problem they're trying to solve to actually like put their life's time and money at risk in order to make a company, they basically stand up and say, it tastes good. Because if you say anything else, you're probably selling drugs. Do you, do well, you see that changing? No, I don't. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's, we have two very powerful industries in America, the financial industry and the pharmaceutical industry. Right. And neither one likes competition. <laughs> so that, uh, that I think you will not see that change. Uh, what does require, uh, you know, the problem is you have to do more clinical research. Clinical research in humans is very tedious, very expensive, and yet if you do it, the FDA rules are clear. You can make drug-like claims if they're supported by you know, good clinical research. Uh, and people say, well, that means I can do a couple of rat studies from China. No. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to use humans, and that's one of the problems. The, these effects of these of nutrition or any ingredient is very hard often to see in the absence of having a, a total overall format. If I'm looking at ingredient X, uh, let's say I'll use a polyphenol. If I have some people eating cheeseburgers and others eating basically um, uh, pasta, I want to have different effects. And the, all this noise, this background noise you yeah. get from the other hormonal effects of the food wipe out the subtle effects of the ingredient you're looking at. Well, one of my, my favorite words is called the exposome. And we have that, that epigenome and, and we have our human genome, but the exposome is the set of all environmental variables we're exposed to over the course of our life. And the amount of data in that is so big that it makes the human genome look completely trivial because it, it's all the things that no one thought about, like the combination of this food and that food. And you know, what was the atmospheric pressure? Like, like, I have no idea if the position of the stars actually matters or solar flares matter, but they're in my exposome. So we can do data correlation. So there's no end to the amount of data that that we sort of think we're doing a, a double blind study, but all these variables are happening at the same time. And, and this is one of the things that, that I think goes against nutritional research in humans is that unless they're in prison and you control everything that they have access to, you, you really don't get very good data because of all this random that, stuff that happens. And that's, that's the problem. You have to treat uh, human beings like lab rats. You can't let them think. You must provide them all the food and try to control the conditions as best as possible. And then people start whining. It's too hard. Uh, uh, <laughs> say, hey, hey, grow up. And saying, you know, if you want to play with the big boys, act like a big boy. Now, the, the reason why drug companies can get away from this because drugs are more concentrated and have more power, but it also means they have more side effects. Right. That's why in the drug uh, world, we talk about a therapeutic index of a drug. That is, there's a range, a zone a therapeutic zone of which below which the drug won't work, above which the drug is toxic. Now, for cancer drugs, that therapeutic zone is about one. T- cancer drugs are about as toxic as they are basically um, useful. So that's why our war on cancer has failed for the last 45 years. But uh, again, under the right circumstances, and I've published studies that have done this type of you know treating humans like red lab rats, you can get very consistent results. Uh, and the, one of the best ways of doing this are doing crossover studies where now you're taking into account the, uh, the, the lack of genetic variation using each individual in basically over and over again. There are more complex studies than double-blind placebo, 
but here's your typical nutritional study coming out of Harvard Medical School. You get a lot of fat people together, you split them in two groups, one group you give them, here's a diet book of X, here's a diet book of Y, read the books and come back two years later. You say, you gotta be kidding. You gotta be kidding. And then they say diets don't work. Of course they work, but they only work if you're taking them at, at the right dose at the right time. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what about, uh, uh, like, like for instance on the zone diet, you have specific percentages of macronutrients for a meal. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I'm finding men and women seem to have different requirements uh, for carbohydrate, for, on average, not always, I like some people. Have you noticed something like that? Or, or is it pretty much like, like the, the standard uh, macronutrient ratios are, are pretty much fixed? And you've, spent, you've no, seen a I, lot more people than I ever have. You know, I, I think on page um, 82, I said, here's the, the average ratio. Uh, on page so it is 83, an average, my okay. first book, I said, it's a bell-shaped curve because cool. we're not all genetically identical. But Great. the curve isn't that wide either. So, But basically, you have to do some variations and take into account genetic variability. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the problems with, uh, you know, when I wrote the book, The Zone, it was really written for cardiologists. The right. fact that anybody ever read the book or even bought the book, let alone read it, <laughs> was always amazing to me and even more so to my publisher. <laughs> That's hilarious. I had no idea. So, but, but again, it was, uh, I went to that detail to, to, to illustrate the cardiologist. You have to treat food like a drug. There's a rhyme or reason. It's not based on, I think, and say, Here's the data of basically they'll probably give the best hormonal responses. Now, that's a testable hypothesis. And in all the studies which have been well controlled, and there aren't that many, but in those studies which have been published, the zone diet has been found to be, be, be the best diet relative to controlling hormonal responses in terms of losing excess body fat, in terms of basically reducing uh, the levels of appetite, and more importantly, and the reason why I developed the zone diet, in reducing inflammation. Yeah. One of the problems I, I you know, have tried to fight over the last 20 years, say, it's a weight loss program. I said, has anybody no. ever read the book? No. <laughs> it's an inflammation control program. In inflammation in a zone. You need some, yeah. but not too much. So again, that uh, if I was a better writer, maybe they would have understood this 20 years ago. But at 20 years ago, no one knew anything about inflammation. Well, I, I was 20 years ago uh, around 280 pounds at the time. I'd been as high as 300. I was living in a, a water damage building, so I had toxic mold exposure, which directly turns on inflammation throughout the body. And it'd be a whole bunch of different cytokine pathways, which we didn't understand back then anyway. Uh, and I, I did uh, all sorts of different diets, but the zone diet had a, a really profound effect. And I remember that this time I was eating handfuls of almonds because you're the first person I'd ever seen who was writing about how these things controlled inflammation. And I was, I went to this nutrition seminar at lunch. I work for a big Silicon Valley company uh, right there on great America Parkway where Cisco and all the big companies are. And they brought in this, this kind of chubby nutritionist and, and she was telling us that we all had to eat like, like no fat. And I'm sitting there at lunchtime, like eating like a handful of almonds going, Oh no, I'm eating my almonds like to help protect my arteries. And, and this lady like started spitting. She was so mad that I could say something so offensive a, as that. And, and I just, even then, I, I noticed a difference in my inflammation, which was my primary problem there. And the hormonal responses yes. and all were off. Uh, uh, I, I noticed a difference from shifting to something that, that was, in fact, I had read the zone diet and I was adding olive oil to my things. And, and I it upped my fat a little bit because I'd been low fat before that. I also I tried Atkins. I tried all sorts of stuff. Um, but... Uh, I, I did notice a change from adding that stuff. I changed from using my antioxidants and, and things like that. And, and then my doctor tells me, oh, you got to stop using vitamin C, you know, three grams a day. Like, that could kill you, was his direct words. And it was that moment that I'm like, you know what? These guys don't have, like, they don't have a clue. Like, like they're, they're, they don't know who Linus Pauling is. And for people listening who don't know who he is, that's okay. You're not a doctor. You shouldn't be expected to know. But he won like two Nobel Prizes, took 90 grams of vitamin C a day, and is one of the big researchers in the space. So... Uh, that that sort of thing really frustrated me, but your book was one of the guiding lights that led me go, to think, okay, I, I've got to do something differently. Uh, and as I fast forward 20 years, I also, just like you believe, inflammation is, is at the very core of it. Uh, and I found that there was a few things that, uh, at least for me and for a lot of people, 
tend to correlate with inflammation. One of them is excessive omega sixes, like like from soy and cheese. Definitely. And, and what do you think about like like the omega six to omega three ratio and and things like that? And and kind of what what's your take on that now that you've had twenty years to see the results? Well, actually, that's where I got started forty years ago, uh, because okay. I was looking at both omega six and omega three fatty acids are known as essential fatty acids. Why are they essential? They are the building blocks of powerful hormones that control inflammation. They're called acosinoids. Big word 20 years ago, still a big word today. <laughs> but you need a balance. And as long as you maintain a balance, you have a, basically a, a nice uh, you know, homeostasis. But what's happened in America is that our ability to make omega-6 fatty acids has become monumental uh, in terms of our, their, our ability and lowering the price. As a consequence now, omega-6 fatty acids, vegetable oils rich in them, are now the cheapest source of calories in the world today. And as a consequence, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 has dramatically increased. And since the omega-6 fatty acids are the building blocks of pro-inflammatory hormones, our levels of inflammation have also increased dramatically. And as a consequence, almost virtually every disease state we're railing against obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, these are all known to be inflammatory diseases, and yet we are fueling that fire by incorporating more and more omega-6 fatty acids in our diet, and to add insult to injury, when we basically start increasing the levels of insulin, that's like adding a match to a vat of gasoline, a lighted match. You get an explosion of inflammation. And that's what's happening. It basically happened yeah. first in America because we were ground zero in omega-6 fatty acids. Once we saturated our society, we looked for export markets. We found them throughout the world. When I first went to Italy about, oh, oh, 20 years ago, the first question I was asked, actually it wasn't a question, it's a statement. How dare you? How dare you as an American tell us what to eat? Americans are fat because they are stupid. <laughs> they are lazy, and they can't cook. I said, all those things are probably true, except everything you see in the shores of America will be on your shores in 10 to 15 years. Today in Italy, Italian children are now the fattest in Europe. One generation ago, they are the leanest. That's because they're lazy, right? They're lazy, and they're, and they're stupid. Just like I was when I weighed 300 pounds, yeah. Well, the reason why, you know, uh, you know if you basically... The reason why you gained the 300 pounds in the first place is because you had developed a fat trap. Yeah. The calories were coming into the mouth and being trapped in your fat cells and not being released to make energy, such as ATP. So literally, you were basically gaining weight, but you were starving at the same time. I was tired as hell at the time. I was just exhausted all the time. And when you're fat, when you're exhausted, you have no emotional regulation because you don't have enough energy. And, yeah. and that's yeah. basically what, you know, it's not because people are weak-willed. They have caused a significant change in their metabolism that they are constantly starving of energy. Without uh, the adequate levels of uh, you know, energy being released from the fat cells, which is our Swiss bank account, we cannot make enough ATP. When you can't make enough ATP, you do two things. You either slow down or eat more calories. They're, those are not the cause of obesity. They are the consequence of basically developing a fat trap caused by increased inflammation. Now, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of people listening to, to the show right now, and probably, well, if they've been listening for a while, let's say only 40% of them are obese instead of 50%. <laughs> so what would you say to someone who's like, all right, I acknowledge that I have an inflammation problem, and I acknowledge that it's not that I'm weak-willed, it, it's that like, there's something wrong metabolically. What, what's step one, what's step two, what's step three uh, uh, that you recommend for, for people who are trapped with these fat traps, with these well, inflammation Well, step, step one is saying it's not your fault. Yes. And that's, now, now you relieve the guilt. Yes. Uh, it's like saying, oh, this person has uh, breast cancer. They're a weak-willed person. Say, it's not their fault. Yeah. So let's get over the guilt aspect. Say, okay, it's not my fault. What's causing the problem? Say, your, your metabolism is out of whack. Our goal, and what's metabolism? It's a nice big word that says converting dietary calories into energy in this black box called the metabolism. We have to do a better job of doing this. And in doing so, how do you know it's going to work? You're not hungry for the next five hours after your meal. 
that's your sign from God, you have rectified your metabolism. <laughs> I say, well, I mean God wants to speak to me? Yes, if you just eat the right thing, and how do you know? Look at your watch five hours after your last meal. If you're not hungry, your last meal was hormonally correct for your biochemistry and your genetics. People don't eat that many things. They eat maybe 10 different meals their entire life. Two different breakfasts, three different lunches, and five different dinners. And they go out to restaurants, they go to the same restaurant over and over again. Maybe five restaurants. The menus are very large. They eat the same thing over and over again. We're, we're creatures of habit. So you keep adjusting the things you eat at home and the things you eat out until the watch says, I'm not hungry. Now you so think, five, now I found the right mechanism for myself. Five hours. That's the and, secret. Now, something that blew my mind when I was developing Bulletproof Coffee, and, and Bulletproof Coffee is grass-fed butter, special coffee that doesn't have some toxins that affect mitochondrial respiration that, that come from fermenting coffee, and brain octane oil, which is a, a purified, it's one of the four kinds of MCT that raises ketones. Usually within a half hour, you can get your blood ketones up enough to suppress uh, ghrelin and to, and to turn on CCK. These are hunger hormones for people listening who aren't biochemist nerds. And uh, when I do that, the first day with someone, the odds are they're gonna go five hours. But it's not really a, a complete breakfast. It, it's almost like a form of fasting. There's only fat, there's no carbs, there's no protein. It's just fat, some polyphenols from coffee, but the hormonal response is so strong and so sudden that if, if you can't do five hours after that, like something's very broken. What do you think of an approach like that? And it's okay to be really critical of it. Like I, I you're a very learned guy, and I, I like what, what's your take on that? Is it, is it a hack? Because it meets those requirements in almost everyone. Oh, it does. But uh, again, we go back to the earlier aspect. We have to have adequate levels of essential amino acids in the course yes. of the day. We have to have adequate levels of essential fatty acids in the course Correct. of the day, and uh, enough uh, and the right balance of those to maintain insulin in a zone. Now, you're quite right, the fat will have no effect on insulin. Uh, the medium chain triglycerides were actually uh, developed first at Harvard Medical School back in the 80s for treating burn victims. Right. Now, how they work, it's unique because they are the medium chain triglycerides are relatively water soluble. They enter into the uh, bloodstream through the portal vein, they go directly to the liver, and they're metabolized there on the spot. But to do so, they wipe out all the stores of glycogen. That's why you get the ketosis very quickly. But now you have no reserve levels to basically uh, maintain blood sugar levels for the brain, the only organ that, that can basically use uh, energy. How do now, they, what, how do they the, wipe out glycogen? I, I wasn't Because again, aware of that. The, the, the burn the, the, the fatty acids, because the short chain fatty acids are also very effective surfactants. They okay. dissolve membranes. So there's a good reason that say, you're in here, but you're out of here. We're going to convert you to CO2 and water as quickly as possible. Okay. To do this, we need some carbohydrates. So that's why they induce the ketosis. They take the reserves of the glycogen. Now, that's okay. You'll get the five hours. No question about that. But, and the studies at Harvard Medical School have shown this, if you maintain a ketogenic diet, what occurs after about an adaptation, after a one or two months, is that you start to increase the levels of cortisol. Yes. If you're not going to basically put enough carbohydrates into your mouth, the brain will say, so now his buddy Mr. Cortisol to start tearing down muscle mass to make glucose for the brain. This is why even during starvation diets, uh, when you're bringing in no food, that the blood sugar levels never really drop below, uh, say, maybe about 60. They're very low, but they don't go to zero because the body is now using a countervailing hormonal response and then it increased production of cortisol and there's also a corresponding decrease in thyroid hormone production. Yes. So uh, what you're looking at is for that sweet spot. So, you know, I'm using the Bulletproof uh, coffee with the, um, uh, you know, the medium chain triglycerides as an early morning drink. Okay, that's good. But it's not something you want to be doing all the time because otherwise you have no way. You're basically almost inducing an increase in cortisol down the road. Because you want to have lunch and you want to have dinner and you want to have some carbohydrates then, right? You have to. because Exactly. Again, that, That's what I recommend, by the way. Um, it's saying that, you know, uh, we can get, you know, and what they're looking at, remember, the word breakfast means comes from breaking the fast. Mm -hmm. And so what you need is, I need to get some energy because, uh, 
because without that, I'm going to have a hard time getting out of bed. So again, the, uh, the development of ketosis early in the morning can give you a burst of energy, but you say, I've used up some of my reserves. I've got to replenish them. So one of the, the biggest questions that people asked on Facebook is, is there's been an explosion in, in research on intermittent fasting, the idea of not eating for 18 hours a day. I'm a proponent of doing it, although during the non-eating period, I use Bulletproof coffee to, to just spike ketones. So you're still keeping insulin, you're keeping protein digestion enzymes low. But let's set aside the Bulletproof version of that. When you look at the zone principles and, and the 40-30-30 uh, idea, and you look at that in the context of intermittent fasting, are you a, a fan of intermittent fasting, a, not a fan of it, or, or sometimes, sometimes, but like many people ask this question, so what, what's your take on intermittent fasting? I'm, I'm dying to know this. Well, the, the take is that the, the uh, published studies have looked at a meta-analysis of intermittent fasting versus low calories, saying there doesn't seem to be much of a difference. Now, because it is a calorie still is a calorie. Calories do count. Uh, if I, I'll use an example. Let's say that uh, if I have a diet where I'm just loading lots of fat in the system, I have no reason to release my stored fat from the adipose tissue because that fat in the bloodstream can now be go directly to the mitochondria in the uh, liver and also into the um, uh, muscles to make ATP. So again, that you know, to really basically live longer, you have to restrict calories. Uh, to lose weight, you have to restrict calories. Now, you want to do that without hunger and without fatigue. Does that mean the converse, though, that, that to lose weight, you have to restrict calories? Does that mean if you restrict calories, you'll lose weight? No. Okay, no. that's really, for people listening, that's a huge difference. <laughs> okay. It's a, it's a very, di- that's right. When you say you have to restrict calories, but I said you can never be hungry and never be tired. You can never be tired because you have to be able to make con- you know, adequate levels of ATP. You can't be hungry because you're keeping your hormones in that zone. So now that's why a calorie is a calorie, but not in terms of hormonal responses. So that now we have say, you have to restrict calories, but you have to keep your hormones in that zone to allow you to function in the highest levels of efficiency. And that's my definition is the maximum conversion of dietary calories to ATP. And then you have a system you can follow for a lifetime. There are various substances that enhance ATP production. Uh, or actually, you can get straight ATP and, and use it sublingually if you want to. Uh, what role do those have to play in that equation or in human performance? I, I think a fairly small role. Uh, the body is an amazingly efficient machine. Uh, but uh, ATP is interesting because the, any, st- any cell in the body will only store about 10 seconds worth of ATP. Right. You have to make it on demand. And you never know when that demand's going to be. So basically, the body has an ability to say, I can't store ATP. I, I, I can easily store excess fat in the adipose tissue, but I can't store ATP, but I can make it on demand. And uh, now I have to basically call in a wide number of different me- me- mechanisms to do that to maintain myself. Primary, the heart. You know, you think about muscles, there's basically the super muscle yeah. that keeps on pumping day in, day out, and without a, us paying attention to it, but it's consuming massive levels of ATP. Likewise, the brain is basically a, a basically an, a glucose hog because it needs that to make the ATP to keep it going. So there, there's a lot of, of you know, nuances, but in the reality, your grandmother was at the cutting edge of 21st century biotechnology. She told you four things. She said, eat small meals throughout the day. Why? Food was very expensive in those days, and therefore, you can only have small meals. Two, she said, have adequate protein, and ideally throughout the day. And not only adequate protein, but adequate protein rich in leucine. Of the 20 amino acids, only one, leucine, can activate another gene transcription factor called mTOR that makes muscle. And she also said, you basically have to, you can't leave the table until you eat all your vegetables. Why? They contain the polyphenols and the fermentable fiber your guts need. And the last thing your grandmother told you, you're not going to leave the house until you take your tablespoon of cod liver oil. Now, everything she said was right now at the forefront of biotechnology. Wow, she was really smart. No, she was really at the, you know, the uh, really the 
accumulation of millennia of observations of what works and what doesn't. And we've let the wisdom of those observations of, you know, since the beginning of human history 200,000 years ago, go by the wait side after World War II in our, really our, you know, going after cheap food. It opened the Pandora's box. Industrialized food, say, we can give you food that's incredibly tasty, incredibly cheap, but there'll be some collateral damage. We're seeing it right now. Not collateral damage of obesity, but the collateral damage, and this goes to your other question about the, um, the environmental factors, but basically altering our gene structure. Not altering the gene structure, but the expression, and really at the epigenetic level. And this becomes a very, very scary aspect. Because again, we are witnessing the de-evolution, I believe, of the human genome. And this is what's called transgenerational epigenetics. And basically, this is why each generation is getting fatter. Why? Because the, these changes in the ep, you know, epigenome is now being carried forward and amplified from one generation to the next. My first book is called The Better Baby Book. And it was, what do you do before you get pregnant to prevent that effect so you can yes. have smarter, happier kids? And I, I did it for my, my own family because my wife was infertile. She had PCOS when she was 35, and we had our kids at 39 and 42 uh, without using all the fertility drugs and things like that, using this amazing drug called food, yep. <laughs> as you called it, <laughs> and turning off inflammation, turning down fungal stuff that, that is correlated, and then trying to send that signal uh, to the to, to my wife's body so that it, it'll select the right egg, basically, that says, all right, uh, this is an environment where there's adequate fat, where there's adequate antioxidants, where there's enough calories, enough bioavailable calories, where you can select for a, a, someone to thrive in that versus selecting for a, an energy famine uh, or a highly stressed world. And I, I can't tell you with an AB double blind study that that works. It's kind of hard to do that with pregnancy. Well, <laughs> but it, it's hard I to do it. Well, actually, we're doing those studies actually right now in Italy. Uh, I, I wrote a textbook last year. Um, called the metabolic consequences of, um, of pregnancy. And um, why that worked for your wife with uh, you know, polycystic ovary syndrome, it's a condition characterized by insulin resistance. Yes. What you were doing was basically by of experimentation, saying I'm, she's seemingly getting better, but once I reduce the inflammation, the fertility returns. It's it almost magical. It was interesting. She's a, a Karolinska-trained physician. Uh, she practiced drug and alcohol addiction, emergency medicine, uh, internal medicine kind of stuff, and, and reasonably well-trained. And she was not overweight by a long shot, but she was doing a couple things that just triggered inflammation. And one of them was soy milk, and the other one was uh, excessive uh, uh, ground, pre-ground flax meal consumption, you know, pre-oxidized flaxseed oil. And when we just took those two things away, it affected her ability to gain weight, like healthy weight. She, she was too thin. And, and it, it's funny, those are both primary triggers for inflammation for hormonal problems. Um, what, what's your take, by the way, on, on those things? Those For, for me, I, I, I know the biochemistry, at least I think I do. But what's your take on, on soybean, uh, uh, at least on soy milk and on flaxseed specifically? Because flaxseed is a very interesting subject. Well, in I, of I wrote a whole book on uh, soy called The Soy Zone, surprisingly. And it was a book to demonstrate to even vegans you could follow the zone diet very effectively. Actually, the zone diet is not a diet. What it is, it's a blueprint mm -hmm. of how to balance your plate. It brings peace to our time because it, it's, it's a dietary blueprint that basically says whatever your dietary philosophy, you can follow it. Because it's simply saying take two-thirds of your plate and fill it with colorful carbohydrates. They're called fruits and vegetables. That is universal between a vegan, a lacto-ovo-vegetarian, a paleo, or an omnivore. So the only sense of contention is the last third of the plate. It has to be protein. If you're a vegan, your choices are somewhat limited, but you can do it. If you're a lacto-ovo-vegetarian, you have much greater choices. Uh, a paleo advocate, you basically take out certain aspects. If you're omnivore, you have complete freedom. But other than that one-third of the plate, which basically is driven by dietary philosophy, the plates are all identical. And now, going back to uh, the soybean, there are a lot of anti-nutrients in soybean. Yeah. It, is not, it is not benign. I went through that book and said, 
There are some good points about soy protein, but only if you remove all of the anti-nutrients, which are massive, and because they can also have hormonal effects, especially on inhibiting thyroid binding. Yes. And uh, I had the, the experience with my own daughter, uh, who basically, uh, she couldn't, uh, my wife was having trouble getting enough breast milk for her, so we went to uh, formula milk. She couldn't handle the um, uh, formula milk, so we went to soy milk. And 10 years later, she developed severe hypothyroidism. Yeah. So again, uh, I say it's okay if you're able to basically take all these anti-nutrients out, and it's tough. Uh, as far as flaxseed, when you grind the flaxseed, you're exposing it to oxidation, yes. and flaxseeds oxidize very quickly, and an oxidized fat is incredibly toxic because it's going to set off and complete a series of inflammatory responses. So, you know, going back, you say at the molecular level, the two things she did removed possibilities of hormonal disruption and increased inflammation. That matches uh, my understanding of things really well. I have also read, and, and this is not well, uh, well publicized, but I, it, it looks to be true uh, based on a couple of studies that came across. When you look at the amount of these phytoestrogens, the, these the things that are estrogens that are made by plants, soy is a primary source of them, as I'm sure you know. But flaxseed oil, or at least flaxseeds themselves, are, are substantially higher in phytoestrogens than, than even soy. But it's sort of like baked into everything. It's sort of a panacea. And I look at like a baked flaxseed, and I go, why would you do that? Because <laughs> the, the oil in that thing is, is clearly damaged at this point because it's unstable just in air. Uh, are you an advocate of, of flax in, under any circumstances? Not really. Yeah, me I either. Mean, okay. it, it's, uh, you know, the, the flax, you know, the flax is rich in... A, short chain omega-3 fatty acids and say, oh, this is good. Say, except they have no anti-inflammatory properties unless they're transformed into the longer chain omega-3 fatty acids found in fish. Mm -hmm. Now, fish can't make these, but they simply accumulate algae. It's pond scum that basically gives us a, one of the gifts of life. Uh, and so I had to take in massive amounts of flaxseed oil, even if it's purified, to get the same benefit of a much smaller amount um, same anti-inflammatory benefits of a much smaller amount of fish oil. But if I take in so much flaxseed oil, I have got now a really a, a smoking bomb in the blood because the long, the the three fatty acid groups are now much more prone to oxidation than the two fatty acid, uh, you know, unsaturated double bonds in things like linoleic acid. So you're putting a much greater oxidative stress on the body and the body responds to oxidative stress by increased inflammation. Uh, so uh, for everyone listening right now, that, that's one of the many reasons that, that just kind of liberally putting flaxseed oil all over the place maybe isn't a good idea. It's politically correct, yeah. but, but, but hormonally, it's not a good idea. Yeah, and I even see it in some paleo type of things. I'm like, man, if you look at the fatty acid things, it, it's just it, it's not meant to be there, and it doesn't seem like a good thing. Uh, what about chia seeds? Uh, what, well, chia seeds chia? are the flaxseed of uh, South America. You know, flax seeds are grown in uh, the upper climates of um, Canada and mm -hmm. uh, uh, northern Europe, and chia seeds are grown down in the Patagonian region in uh, Chile. Mm -hmm. they, only, so, they only grow the, the omega-3 fatty acids in plants grow in response to cold temperatures. So they're, they're different species, though, right, as far as I understand? Different uh, species, but uh, basically from a human standpoint, they are identical. They're, no kidding, including the phytoestrogen levels. Yep. That I did not know. I knew that the saturated or the monounsaturated. Uh, there's a lot of good. There's a lot of nice things in flax seeds. That, as long as they aren't ground up, they contain lignans, which are right. very very interesting. So I I I tell people sprinkle some flax seeds on uh, a meal. Whole flax seeds, right? Uh, whole flax seeds, and right. you know they give a nice crunchy taste, and you're getting the lignans, which has some very very nice benefits, but don't right. overdo it. I used to take a flax lignans. It, it took 45 pounds of flax to make a little yep. bottle of flax lignans. And that seemed like the best way to enjoy flax. <laughs> but it was kind of expensive, and I'm not sure it did. Yeah, and uh, again, that uh, you're still getting a lot of omega-3 fatty acids, the short ones and oxidized ones with yeah. those lignans. A very fair point. Uh, it, it was your work that originally led me to change how I cook. Because you helped me to, to understand, all right, oxidized fats of any flavor are bad for you. And where I, I ended up is, okay, if I'm going to be cooking something that contains fat, like I try not to cook with fat, if I cook something with fat in it, I usually add a little bit of water and I use lots of antioxidant spices on it. 
because yep. the water keeps the temperature down. Uh, so you know you're not going to get the the burner temperature. You're going to get the temperature of steam and no no more. And I I believe that the cooking is one of those things that triggers inflammation in a way that the people oftentimes just don't think about. So you see these paleo meals and like what did you do to that that rib? <laughs> like I, I'm not sure that that's a good thing to eat anymore. Well, it, yeah, th- this is why that you know you know there's some very very good scientific studies on a paleo, a paleo. That's where I actually the zone diet started. When I read uh, the book, uh, the uh, paper by Boyd Eaton in the oh, no kidding. you know, New England Journal of Medicine, of looking at what he thought at the time was the best ratio of protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Now, in 2010, uh, Boyd and other colleagues, who are all academic researchers, uh, updated their studies and they said, to our best estimate, what the Paleolithic diet, at least in East Africa, was 15,000 years ago, was, I believe, 40% carbohydrates. Yeah. Uh, 31% fat and 29% protein. I said, that's good enough. I'll take that. That's pretty different than 40, 30, 30. I mean, come on. Barry. I know, I know. Basically, it's, <laughs> no, yeah. So, but uh, it's good enough for government work. But the thing that same article pointed out that, you know, uh, those same paleolithic individuals were eating between 6 and 14 grams a day of long chain omega 3 fatty acids from, you know, fish. And that's why you look at uh, human evolution. Much of it was always along the seacoast because mm-hmm. it was fish that gave us the, the ability to break out of the mold and basically improve our brain power. Well, let's talk about that for a little while. We have EPA and we have DHA, like, like the two fish oils. And you talked about cod liver oil from our grandmothers earlier. Now, I, I've, I, I'm a fan of krill oil because it's phosphorylated because it's more bioavailable for the brain because there's antioxidants in it. Uh, but... For people listening, there's a good number of them who eat fish, like I do. Uh, there's a good number of them who supplement with either fish oil or some other potentially pond scum derived uh, kind of omega three. What is the ideal EPA to DHA ratio in a supplement that you'd recommend? Well, again, that uh, what we've done over the years, we've always used a really a two to one ratio of EPA to DHA, and the reason why I always like both because they do different things. The EPA is more anti-inflammatory than the DHA. The yep. DHA has structural properties that make it very unique compared to the EPA, and both at high levels can make another group of hormones called resolvins, which are really the holy grail of medicine. So you need them both, but you need adequate levels. What I try to do is not say how much you should eat, but tell people the blood will tell you. This is not a guessing game. Take a blood test. Now, people hate to take blood tests. Why? It hurts. That's why most people have their annual physical every five years. <laughs> but now that's why we, you know, we've developed a finger stick test, a drop of blood. You can measure now all the fatty acids. But we look for the ratio. In not a drop of, of EPA blood? DHA, but of a rocketonic acid to EPA. Yeah. That's the marker of inflammation. And your goal is to keep it between 1.5 and 3. Because okay. that's a sweet spot of controlling inflammation. You, For example, the average American is 18, which explains why our healthcare costs are so high. You just read my mind. My next question was going to be, if I measure my blood and I look at my omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, uh, what should it be? And you said between 1.5 and, and, three. and 3. But that, that is, but really look at the ratio of a rocketonic acid, which is the okay. precursor of the hormones, the direct precursor, and EPA, the direct precursor of the okay. anti-inflammatory it, hormones. It's a different number then because it, it's just of one of the things. And, and it, for supplementation use, you do two EPA for one DHA. Yes. But, but again, the key is not looking so much at the ratio, but you need adequate levels of both, and that's why basically you're titrating the goal. Just like you do with statin, you titrate the goal. How much statin should I take, doc? Well, let's check your blood. If it's yeah. uh, too high, I'll give you more statins. Of course, more side effects, but more statins. <laughs> and the same is true of omega-3 fatty acids. How much should I take? The blood will tell you. What if you get too many, though? I, I mean, like, there are some people well, saying too much fish oil can mess you up, and I've seen it happen. Like, like wh- wh- How do you certainly. know when you've got too much? Well, there's two things about fish oil. One, most fish oil on the market is basically unsuitable for human consumption. Correct. They, they, make, fl- they make flaxseed look good. And two, <laughs> can you take too much? Of course you can't. Uh, actually, a very good study is called the Jealous Study. Some 18,000 Japanese who already had a low ratio 
and they're all taking statins, but they took more fish oil, half did. And by, t- by lowering their ratio from 1.5, which you find in the Japanese population, to 0.8, you saw a significant improvement or significant reduction in cardiovascular events, even though they're all taking the statin, but there was an increase in bleeding. So that's why I like to use as a stopgap, never go below 1.5, but never go above three. Now, you mentioned statins a couple times there. Are you a, a, a user of statins? Do you advocate them? Please. No, I hate statins. <laughs> okay, I hate you had statins. me scared for a minute there. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I, I don't have a guy who's still promoting statins on my show. Like I would if you had a good argument, but okay. Uh, I have no good arguments whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> the statins you know, are the only drug known in medical science that can increase the production of arachidonic acid. Yeah. Uh, this is why cardiologists love statins, neurologists hate statins. Statins were uh, poised as a, you know, using an edge, you know, for the drug company is very effective. If your cholesterol levels are high, you're going to die. Now, it's not true, but it's a great, a great ad. Uh, but the fact is that statins were not the first drugs to lower cholesterol. They were the 19th. The, for the first 18 all lowered cholesterol by the increased mortality. Somehow statins <laughs> say, oh my God, it didn't increase mortality and we actually lowered cholesterol. It works. Uh, it turns out that um, the reason why, because it turns out the statins had an unknown side effect. There are also anti-inflammatory drugs. Yep. So that, uh, that's the reason why they work. But even today, people taking statins, they'll have uh, between a 10 to 20% chance of getting a heart attack within the first year. They're because not of mito- because of mitochondrial poisoning, basically. It's, you know, th- these are you know these are nasty little drugs. And again, the most common side effect uh, is again loss of memory, besides the, the yeah. muscle weakness. So uh, they have, but the marketing has been superb. The scare tactics have been uh, amazing. The, there is one statin drug that I absolutely love that really helped me to to feel amazing. It was the first statin drug ever discovered. It's called Nystatin. Yep. <laughs> and it's an antifungal agent that isn't absorbed and doesn't have a mitochondrial effect. But every statin drug there is, is a potent antifungal, which is a very interesting side effect because if you have a fungal infection, depending on the type of fungus it is, your body will raise cholesterol as a way to help escort those fungal-borne toxins out of the body. Uh, and I'm not saying that's the primary reason they work. It's not, but it, it, it's an interesting thing that there's these little angles to the drugs that's just not known, but I do know that affecting the, the fungus growing in the gut can have a profound effect on weight loss. Oh, no, no question. And now, now, now we come to the whole area of gut health. Yeah, let's uh, talk about that. Yeah, you know, Hippocrates said this you know, 2,500 years ago. He said two things. Let food be your medicine. Mm-hmm. Let medicine be your food. Okay, what did the old guy know? He also said, you know, all disease begins in the bowel. And he's yes. probably right, because again, we now know one of the problems is what is called metabolic endotoxemia. Yes. That it basically very small fragments of bacteria, especially gram-negative bacteria, if we have even the trace amounts of a leaky gut, can get into the blood, and once they're in the blood, you set off DEFCON 3 of basically not, not as much as you would get it with sepsis, which means death, half the people get it, but at maybe 100 times lower levels, where basically you now are increasing low-level chronic inflammation below the perception of pain. Mm. And this is how, why 80% of all antibiotics made in America are sold to given to uh, raising uh, farm-raised beef, chickens, and cattle. Why? They basically cause dysbiosis in the gut, leading to uh, leaky gut syndrome, where just enough of the gram-negative bacteria into the bloodstream to interact with toll-like receptor 4, to cause chronic inflammation, and one of the first aspects, you gain weight very quickly. <laughs> it's, it's worked very well for animals in the last 50 years. It also works for humans. This is one of the primary, primary reasons that when people say, you know, it's calories in, calories out, you just have to exercise more, and, and you basically you're fat and lazy and have no self-control if you're fat. It's, it's like, look, you can take a cow and you can give them uh, hormones in their ear, a, a xenoestrogen it's called xeranol, which come from mycotoxin purified from aspergillus, or you can give them antibiotics, and either one. Very, very low levels. It doesn't yeah, take yeah. much. 
yeah, very low levels, gives them a 30% increase in feed efficiency, which means the cow got fat on 30% less calories, which is impossible if it's calories in and calories out. Like, how is this happening? Somehow well, it is. This is the complexity of nutrition. Yeah. And that oftentimes you gra- you know, people grab on to saying, this is the holy grail. And saying, come on, come on, where do you, you know, this is the 21st century. This is a complex interplay. Yes. But, uh, you know, people are looking for the simple answers, and there are no simple answers. Uh, because when we're talking about nutrition, we are talking about really genetic change, genetic change of our genes and epigenetic changes. Uh, this is incredibly complex. But we're understanding now how food can basically turn the change our epigenome very, very quickly. Uh, and also affect basically through these gene transcription factors, which are totally unknown 10 years ago, to turn genes on and off, either to our benefit or to our detriment. And uh, that's why I've had the luxury of being in the business long enough. I guess, you know, if, yeah, as Woody Allen said, you know, you know, sticking around long enough is probably the, the pri- primary cause of success to see things rise and fall. But try to put together an overall view saying, that's why I say nobody's, in the old days, there was myself, Bob Atkins, and Dean Ornish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we had Bob saying, <laughs> You know, carbohydrates are evil. Dean saying, no, fats are evil. I said, guys, maybe <laughs> inflammation's evil. And I thought saying, hey, this is great. We can be like the three tenors and, you know, take our show on the road. Except Bob Atkins and Dean Orange hated each other so much. I couldn't keep yeah. up. <laughs> but, uh, but now we have much more competing aspects because it takes time to basically be aware of all the things which have occurred over the last 30 years. 40 years, 50 years, and put them into perspective. And being open-minded that a lot of new things, like I said, polyphenols, mm-hmm. nothing was known about them. Now, uh, when I first wrote the, so I said, okay, that's why I write books, because the area of human nutrition is constantly exploding. Because the area of inflammation is constantly exploding, and how the two intersect. And for me, it's, it's just a wonderful adventure that never changes. But, you know, certain things are, you go back to your grandmother, she was right on target with the four points. Follow that, and you're going to do pretty well. As long as your watch works, if you're not hungry, it's working. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more on that rule. You're the first person I've heard elucidate it that way. But, yeah, if, if you have to eat before five hours, I, there I, I actually, I, I'm a fan of, of blame there. It's like, it's your fault. It's because what you ate in your last meal wasn't right, and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you but did you, have control you, you of that. Take that yeah. You take that as a teaching moment. <laughs> Yes, that, not as a blame thing at all, but it's like, look, you had control and you didn't make the right choice, but now you know you had control, which technically makes it your fault, but it means you can fix it and like it, exactly. it's easy. And, yeah. and that's why that you know people think of diets, oh, I had a bad meal. Say, hey, you know, get a life. You had a bad meal, but you know how to get back on track. Right. I have a couple more questions from, from uh, listeners. One of them is, all right, what about butter? So I'm probably the world's biggest champion of grass-fed butter, not industrial butter, uh, which, which different omega-3 stuff like that. What's your take on butter? Well, there's uh, good things and bad things. Okay. Uh, the good things, I do like the uh, the conjugated uh, linoleic acid. Mm-hmm. It's a very interesting one because it's a very specific stereoisomer in butter, unlike the stuff you buy in a health food store, which actually causes insulin resistance. Really? That's oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Right? The, the other isomer that's not naturally found in uh, you know, butter or uh, beef products basically causes insulin resistance. And so that's why when you basically do studies with uh, you know, the uh, mixtures of the two, you get usually no results. If you basically have only the one isomer, you get very, very good results. So from okay. that standpoint, butter is a very good way of concentrating uh, the natural and most beneficial form of the uh, isomer of conjugated linoleic acid. What I don't like about butter is that it's relatively rich in palmitic acid. Now, stearic acid I actually like uh, because stearic acid is, once it's absorbed, is rapidly uh, uh, desaturated into oleic acid. And that's why stearic acid is the only saturated fat that will not raise cholesterol. Now, palmitic acid, it's it's almost the same. It's about the same. (laughs) It's almost totally different. Palmitic acid is a very, very powerful pro-inflammatory saturated fat. You know, on the scale of 1 to 10, I give it a 15. Uh, because it can interact with specific receptors in cells and the same receptors that basically recognize the 
of fragments of the gram-negative bacteria, lipopolysaccharides. They basically recognize the palmitic acid. Furthermore, the palmitic acid is one that can interact with our hypothalamus and disrupt the satiety signals. And that's why when you look wow. at animal studies, when you feed them a high-fat diet, that's usually high in saturated fat, they get fat very rapidly. Why? They start eating. So it's saying that if I, if I could find saturated, that's one of, that's, I, let's say, uh, coconut oil. One of the good things about coconut oil is very low in palmitic acid. And therefore, say, okay, I'm not going to have the inflammatory effects. Unfortunately, it's basically will have some effects if I take too much and that I'll wipe out my glycogen stores. So, but as a saturated fat, it's not bad. It's butter it has some good parts because it has the conjugated linoleic acid, uh, but it also has a palmitic acid. So, you know, again, we basically kind of you know, have to look weigh the consequences. But one of the the early reasons that I included at first just regular MCT, and eventually I realized that some MCTs don't metabolize the same way as others. I use just one of the, the four kinds of MCT now, the the, the brain octane, the C8. Uh, but uh, that type of MCT actually is uh, protective in the presence of lipopolysaccharides and palmitic acid, which isn't present, which is present in butter enhances lipopolysaccharide absorption. So LPSs are made by bad bacteria in the gut, just for people listening. And then those can migrate across the gut wall when you have any high-fat meal. But when you have something that helps to protect the liver from those at the same time, at least in my experience, I don't get any of that hunger thing. Like, like people do bulletproof coffee and hunger is suppressed in a way that, that most people have never experienced. Like it is a profound thing. But if I do just brain octane oil, Without uh, without any other fats, it doesn't seem to work as well. Like you don't get the full satiety. Like you, you get the long lived satiety when you add the butter, and you get the short term. Like I'm so done from the brain octane, and well, I haven't figured out all I, the reasons. I, I talked about the a couple of good things about the butter, the um, the right isomer of uh, conjugate linoleic acid, and remember, butter is also rich in stearic acid. Ah, that's true. And stearic acid is once it's converted, is rapidly converted to oleic acid. And so that's why now the oleic acid is then converted to basically the ethnolamide version, which is a very powerful now, you know, satiety hormone. It's not the oleic acid itself. It's only when it's converted to the, um, the ethnolamine version of oleic uh, acid. They can now interact with the hypothalamus and say, stop eating. So it could be a stearic acid effect. Interesting. I, I would love to know all the reasons. And, and there's a bunch of other ones I hypothesize in, in the Bulletproof Diet. Uh, but I, I do know that, like, wow, weight loss is a lot easier when you're just not hungry. <laughs> it, well, that, you know, that, that, and that's, that's the whole secret. You know, our whole uh, of, you know, mission to basically control obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes has failed miserably. Yeah. And, but the answer is quite simple. If you're never hungry, you eat less calories, you eat less calories, your blood sugar goes down, your blood lipids go down, your blood pressure goes down. But it's hard to eat less calories if you're always hungry and always tired. So the secret, the secret to basically combating all these metabolic disorders is to basically increase satiety. And it basically, so the battleground is no longer the blood, it's the hypothalamus. That's basically the integration center for all these hormonal inputs coming from the gut and the blood to the brain to say either eat or not eat. And whoever basically solves this best has solved basically the major of uh, you know medical problem of the 21st century. Well, I believe that there's major progress being made, that's for sure. It, if there was only one supplement you could take, what would it be? Omega-3 fatty acids. Okay, and in uh, krill oil, fish oil? What would well, you I wouldn't take them in krill oil for the following reason. Yeah. Um, one, the, uh, the krill oil, uh, again, a study uh, published about two years ago by Norm Salem, show that the, uh, the bioavailability is about the same when you have equal. Interesting. I haven't seen that one. Okay. Uh, another study came out only two weeks ago of basically made the uh, statement that uh, the krill oil actually increases insulin resistance. Okay. I've got to see this. All right. I'll, I, I'll, 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 I'll send it to you. Okay. Thank you. I'd really like that because I'll change my recommendations. It's, 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 it's uh, a very interesting study. And krill oil is, you know, it, it's a little dirty. I mean, people say it's, it comes from the Arctic waters. It has to be clean. Think. <laughs> uh, because the the krill, which are small shrimp, uh, 
you know, basically also contain PCBs. Sure. Uh, now, most people don't know much about uh, krill oil production, but um, it's all that, not all that dissimilar from soybean uh, uh, lecithin production. You take the krill, you dry them down, you extract them with a gasoline hexane, you take the gasoline extract and then add a, a nail polish remover, acetone, to precipitate out the phospholipids. But some of the phospholipids, but some are monoglycerides and some are free fatty acids. So there's a kind of like a mish there, but you have no way of purifying it. So I think the, you know, the krill oil story is, again, we go back to saying you've got to take enough. So again, uh, number one thing is saying, let the blood tell you. The blood will tell you how much okay. you need. And I like that. that's why we go back now to personalized nutrition. The blood will tell you what you have to do. And I use three parameters for my markers of wellness. We have lots of markers of disease, very few markers of wellness. One marker of wellness is the ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA. Okay. The Japanese keep it about 1.5, but they are the biggest eaters of fish in the world. And as a consequence, their levels of PCBs in their blood are near the upper limit set by the World Health Organization. Another parameter is the ratio of triglycerides to HDL in the blood. Mm -hmm. That's a marker of insulin resistance in the liver. Insulin resistance actually manifests first in the liver before other organs, like the muscles or even the adipose tissue. And the final one is glycosylated hemoglobin. We think of this as only for diabetics, but actually it's for everyone. Uh, the sweet spot where you want to be that gives maximum longevity is about 5.0. Maybe that's maybe 1% of the U.S. population. They say, oh, if wow. you're six point, less than 6.5, you're okay. No, you aren't. To get down to 5.0 is really hard work. Y but you have to basically eat a lot less fructose to get there, right? No, well, a lot less carbohydrates. It, less carbs it's in general. It's like yeah. hemoglobin. Uh, the, the fructose story is one that basically also is uh, not has, uh, you know, under careful studies, is saying, come see, come saw. The, the secret is keep all carbohydrates to a lower level. Uh, and you're looking at the glycosylated hemoglobin as your marker, saying, that's where I want to be. Depending on what your blood tells you, it tells you what you have to do in your diet to keep adjusting each of those parameters. But it's because you can't be considered well unless all three of those parameters are in their appropriate ranges. We've said, for the uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, about five. And triglycerides, H2, less than one. For people listening, we'll include the names of all these tests so you can go to the transcript of this episode and get it all. Because I imagine if you're driving right now, you're trying to write all this down and pausing your iPhone. You don't have or, to do or, that. Or texting, even worse. Yeah, exactly. So, so all of this stuff is there. It's on the website. It's searchable. It, it, it's all right. <laughs> uh, this, this is really precious knowledge. And I do track um, all of those things. I don't know if I do my glycosylated hemoglobin quite as regularly as I should, but I, I definitely track those things. I don't remember my last you're number. You're doing right the there. right thing. You yeah. basically, uh, you have to basically have, you know, a constant basically uh, really way stations to say, how am I doing? How am I doing in terms of controlling my future? Uh, and it's saying the best marker is my blood. And I'm looking to base, maintain a zone of wellness as long as possible. That is, uh, that is a great way of looking at it. And two more questions, and then we're done. One is, and this is from Facebook, what do you think about CBD oil for inflammation? Uh, it's, it's interesting because, again, it's, you know, it, it interacts with the same uh, receptors in the brain as endocannabinoids. So that uh, you know, it has some potential benefits, but you know, the same endocannabinoids uh, and the, the CBD would also be likely to do that, can cause hunger. That's why one of the first side effects of, uh, for those who would actually smoke marijuana in the old days, you got the munchies. Right. And so it's very hard to basically, um, you know, uh, control hunger if, you know, those, uh, you know, CB1 receptors in the brain are being activated by uh, endocannabinoids or natural cannabinoids. So I think it has some, some benefits, but there's still a lot to be seen. Okay, more research there. Cool. The final question is, is one that all, I've asked all guests on Bulletproof Radio, and I've always learned a lot from this. If someone came to you tomorrow and said, look, I want to be better at everything I do in my life. Like, I want to kick more ass at everything. Uh, not just exercise, not just career, but just, just, I want to be better in general. What are the three most important things I need to know based on your entire set of experience? 
Well, I think the first thing of you have to have a philosophy. Okay. And if you don't have a philosophy, you don't have a rudder. So you you can't basically you don't know where you're going unless you have a game plan. And one of the best game plans I think that has ever been developed was really Stoic philosophy. It's been around for 2,500 years. It works mm -hmm. very well. It says you're responsible for everything that happens to you. You're responsible for your own happiness and unhappiness. So having a philosophy is a good starting point. Then applying that philosophy to everything you do. Here's the things you have to do. You have to eat right. And the blood will tell you for doing that. You have to exercise. And you need to have stress reduction. Now, if you can basically do those things, and of the three, the stress reduction becomes oftentimes the most difficult. Why? Yeah. I don't have time to sit in a comfortable chair for 20 minutes and think of nothing. It's an amazingly <laughs> powerful tool. So it's saying these are the things you have to make time for. Otherwise, your life will be a lot less of enjoyable than otherwise could be. Awesome. Uh, that's, a, that's a great answer. Uh, Dr. Barry Sears, where can people find out more about your work besides, you know, obviously you're easy to find on Amazon, but what website should they go to check out your I latest work? I find out probably, uh, probably the most probably go to zonediet.com because this will be, give you explanations about inflammation and really diet-induced inflammation. Beautiful. Well, I, uh, I absolutely endorse uh, your work, and you're one of the, the first people to talk about inflammation in such a meaningful way, and that had a profound effect on, on my own thinking and, and on my own uh, path to losing 100 pounds and keeping it off this amount of time. So th thanks for your, your life's work. It, it's, it's really made a difference. Well, thank you for the opportunity of being on the show, and congratulations on the excellent work. Losing weight's easy. Keeping it off, that's the hard part. Absolutely. If you enjoyed today's episode, you know what to do. Go out and check out uh, Dr. Barry Sarah's work at zonediet.com. There's a lot of value there. And think about what you can do to move the needle in the right way for the three biomarkers he talked about, for any of the inflammatory things like homocysteine, LPPLA2, C-reactive protein, the other things that, that I talk about. Because anything you're going to do that lowers your inflammation is going to make you not just feel better, it's actually going to make you nicer. When you're nicer to all the people around you, well, the first thing you're going to want to do is drink more Bulletproof coffee. No, not really. I'm just giving you a hard time. But <laughs> what uh, I do want to say, though, is seriously, when you get on top of the inflammation, the first place you feel it is in your brain. Your personality will change. You actually are nicer. And that, we all win, and you can do that without buying a single thing. Have an awesome day.